All right, so now that we know the orbits or the Bohr orbits or the allowed orbits that, that the electron can possibly take and that we've seen that they're quantized, let's now relate this into what the energies that the electron is allowed to have so that then we can apply that to Bohr's second postulate. So then we can calculate the energy of the light that's given off or that's absorbed by our hydrogen atom. So to do that, what we'll first do is we'll just calculate what is the total energy of the electron. And so the total energy of the electron is simply going to be a summation of its kinetic energy and its potential energy. And I can, of course, write the kinetic energy of the electron is one half times mass of the electron times the velocity of the electron squared. And I can write the potential energy of the electron as minus the charge on the electron, which is just E, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, times the voltage that it's sitting in. And the voltage is due to the nucleus. And so then I would write V is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times E, which is the charge on the nucleus, divided by R. So if I substitute that into this equation, I get the total energy is equal to 1 half mass of the electron times the velocity of the electron minus E squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times R. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach back and I'm going to take a term so that I can basically get rid of this mv squared, which is this term right here. Because I want to write a term in terms of the Bohr radius because now that we have a relationship that describes the Bohr radius in terms of many constants, then I want to now apply that to the kinetic energy or find a way to apply it to the kinetic energy as well. So I'm going to go back to the beginning and right at this point right here, when we were doing this derivation where we were relating the forces, we can see that we have a whole lot of similar constants on the left-hand side as we do down below, and we have the mass of the electron times the velocity squared. So I'm going to take this term, I'm going to multiply both sides by r, and so in the end, what I'm going to get is a term that looks like this. I can write mass of the electron times the velocity squared, that's equal to e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times r. And I'm going to take that term and I'm going to substitute it in for my term for my total energy. 1 half times e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times r. I'm going to subtract from that e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r. I'm going to take my 1 half, I'm going to multiply it in, and what I'm given is total energy is equal to e squared divided by 8 pi epsilon naught r minus e squared. All right, so let's do this subtraction. What I essentially have is my term on the left of the subtraction, this e squared over pi epsilon naught r, and I have 1 eighth in front of it, and I'm subtracting off a term that has all the exact same constants, but it's 1 quarter. And so an eighth minus a quarter, that leaves me with negative an eighth, and then I'll carry over all of those constants, e squared pi epsilon naught over r. And so what we can continue to do as we move forward here is that we have a value that represents this r. And this is something that we determined previously. r was equal to epsilon naught n squared h squared over pi times the mass of the electron times the elementary charge squared. So I'm just going to take that term and substitute that in here for my total energy. So the total energy ET is equal to 1 over negative 1 eighth e squared over pi epsilon naught. And then I'm going to substitute in for the r. On top, I'm going to get pi times the mass of the electron times the elementary charge squared. I'm going to divide that by epsilon naught, h squared, 1 over n squared. And so now I'm going to start grouping together or canceling out terms. I can cross off a pi on top and a pi on bottom. 
this leaves me with a total energy of negative times mass of the electron, elementary charge raised to the power of 4. All that's divided by 8 epsilon naught squared, h squared, and then I have my 1 over n squared. So let's take a step back and now think about what we actually have here, what this actually means. So the first thing that I want you to notice is that there's a negative sign sitting in front of this term. So that means whenever the electron is inside an orbit around a nucleus, at least for the hydrogen atom in this model, we're going to get a negative energy. And what that represents is that the electron is in a bound state. The second thing that I want you to notice is that the energy of the system, the total energy of the electron, is quantized according to n, where n is just some integer number. Again, that's 1, 2, 3. So again, our energy is quantized according to some integer. And that if we set n is equal to 1, that's the lowest energy state. And so what we would call that then is the ground state of our system. And this represents when the electron is the closest to the nucleus. So now that we have, again, this, this, this term that describes the total energy of, of our electron inside an orbit around the nucleus, according to at least the first postulate, or Bohr's first postulate, let's now apply Bohr's second postulate. So Bohr's second postulate it can essentially be summarized as saying that the change in energy when the electron moves from one orbit to the next is equal to h nu. And recall when we talked about the photoelectric effect, this is what Einstein had postulated that the energy of um, a photon or basically a particle of light is quantized by its frequency according to Planck's constant h. And so what we're saying is that this is the light that's coming in or leaving into the system, which then allows an electron to move from one orbital to another. So this is why I'm writing the difference in energy is E final minus E initial, which is just a difference in energy. And that difference in energy is represented by uh, a packet of light that either was emitted or absorbed by the Bohr atom. So that what I'm going to do now is I'm going to explicitly substitute in this total energy term. And I'm going to do it once into E final. And I'm going to do it once again for E initial, because each of these cases is represents a, a total energy of an electron sitting inside an orbit. So I'm going to have to write it out twice. So I have h nu is equal to minus mass of the electron times the elementary charge raised to the power of 4 divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h squared 1 over n final squared. And from that I'm going to subtract off minus mass of the electron elementary charge raised to the power of 4 divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h squared 1 over ni squared. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to distribute out like terms and I'm going to deal with these minus signs. So on the left hand side I still have h nu. I'm going to be carrying out an m e e to the raised to the power of 4 divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h squared. That leaves me with a bracket which only has n final and n initial in it. Put I have this minus sign times this minus sign, so I, that ends up canceling out and I get a plus. So I'm going to write ni squared first, and I'm going to subtract off nf squared. And that's because I have this minus sign in front of the term that has nf in it. I take care of this h nu on this side. And I'm going to convert that into wavelength lambda. And the way that I'm going to do that is I want you to recall that the speed of light c, because we're talking about light, because that h nu represents a photon, then that means its speed is the speed of light. And that's equal to lambda times nu, its wavelength times its frequency. 
So I can rearrange that to say c over lambda is equal to nu. And so I'm going to take this term and I'm going to plug that into there. So in the end what I'm going to get is h c over lambda and that's equal to mass of the electron elementary charge raised to the power of 4 8 epsilon naught squared h squared all times 1 over n i squared minus 1 over n f squared. And then finally what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by h c. So in the end what I'm going to get is 1 over lambda is equal to mass of the electron times elementary charge raised to the power of 4, 8 epsilon naught squared, h squared, actually h cubed, times the speed of light, divided by, or sorry, multiplied by 1 over ni squared minus 1 over nf squared. So again at this point we're going to take a step back and we're going to look at what we have. What I want you to recall is that what Bohr was trying to achieve was he was trying to explain what was being measured experimentally um, as the atomic spectra from, in this case, from hydrogen. And empirically, I want you to recall that the spectra was characterized using the Rydberg equation, which is 1 over lambda is equal to the Rydberg constant times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. And we can start to see that there are some very analogous pieces between these two equations. So for instance, both have this 1 over n squared minus 1 over n squared type term. Both have on the left hand side this 1 over lambda term. And so if we were to believe that the that the Bohr postulates applied in this way was an accurate reflection of reality, then that would mean that all of these constants that are sitting out front must equal, or at least be very close to the Rydberg constant. So let's test that right now. So I'm going to sub in all the numbers for all of these values, this, this constant or these sets of constants that are sitting right here. So the mass of the electron is 9.1093897 times 10 to the minus 31. The elementary charge is 1.602177 times 10 to the minus 19. And that's raised to the power of 4. We'll divide that by 8 times epsilon naught, which is 8.854. 187 times 10 to the minus 12, and that's squared. We'll multiply that by Planck's constant, 6.626076 times 10 to the minus 34, and that's raised to the power of 3. That's then multiplied by the speed of light, 2.9979245. Times 10 to the 8. And I'm using so many decimal points, I'm using a much more exact version of the number because again we're trying to compare this to an empirically measured number. We want to get as close or we want to get as accurate of the number as possible. But when we do the math, what we end up with in the end is 1.09737 times 10 to the 7 inverse meters. So if I do a quick unit conversion, put the meters on the bottom, I know that one meter is equal to 100 centimeters, which means that I have 1.09737 times 10 to the 5 inverse centimeters. Or I can write that simply as 109,737 inverse centimeters. And so what we're going to recall is that the Rydberg constant, and again this was a value that was empirically measured through looking at the hydrogen spectrum, was 109,677.6 inverse centimeters. So the difference between these two numbers is only about half a percent. And this is an astonishing result 
given that in the Rydberg constant case, this was something that was measured from the hydrogen spectra, whereas we ended up developing a model for the atom which almost exactly characterizes or captures that same Rydberg constant. And so based on this result, we can say that we are getting much, much, much closer at least, or have a much better model of what the hydrogen atom looks like.